if I'm not wearing different clothes the next time you see me, something has gone terribly wrong. Unit 3 of Macroeconomics. I know that was a little weird. I apologize. Essentially, I've been filming all day, so, you know, the mind starts to wander, as you can imagine. Unit 3 seems simple. It is, however, the, you know, thrust of all of macroeconomics in one unit. There's not a lot of content. However, there's a lot of application. Did you see that? I tried to itch my head with two hands on two different sides simultaneously. Ooh, this is going in weird places. Okay, here we go. The whole thing kind of hovers around this concept of the long-run aggregate supply graph, which is the mothership of the entire course. It's super important. If you don't want to learn it, then you probably should not show up on game day because it is literally everything. So here's the deal. On the vertical axis is price level. This is just this idea that as we go up on the vertical axis, things cost more, and as we go down, they cost less. Nothing too crazy. On the horizontal axis, we have this capital Y, which refers to national income, real GDP, employment, output. Anytime we're going that way or to the right, these things increase. So generally, that's a good thing. The supply line is upward sloping, and it refers to aggregate supply in the short run, so all things available for sale. And producers, as always, want to sell a large quantity of items at a high price. And the demand line is downward sloping, effectively because consumers don't want to pay a lot. So there are far more people who want to pay less for things to consume. It's the same logic as a basic supply and demand graph, but in this case it's aggregate, so all consumers and producers. The long run line is vertical for a myriad of reasons, but the main one is this. We operate under this assumption that there is a natural rate of unemployment, roughly 35 to 6%. That's frictional plus, structure, plus structural unemployment. And if we know the same quantity of people are always working here forever more, then theoretically, no matter what change in price occurs, output is going to be the same no matter what. This is obviously some hefty assuming and clearly kind of nonsense because even if that unemployment rate is low, we have more people being born, so on and so forth. So really over time, no matter what, that long run line is going to go to the right, hopefully assuming we are at the Roman Empire. But you know. Okay, things that can shift supply. Labor, capital, resources. If you have any more of those, then short run aggregate supply would shift right, which would be a positive supply shock, increasing employment, decreasing prices. Anything less would be left at stagflation. That's a bad thing. We have less people working and prices are higher. Stagflation is not good. The demand line shifts through basically the expenditure equation for GDP. Consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Anytime any one of these increases, demand shifts right. Anytime it decreases, shifts left. Nothing too wild and crazy. Where this chapter gets ultra awkward is when we talk about fiscal multipliers because for the first time since we did CPI, you have to do some math. And in this case, they're going to give you either MPC, marginal propensity to consume, or MPS. Those two things are a percentage of something very specific the marginal income. So if you get a, a raise in your wages of $1,000, that's your marginal new income, and the percentage is a reflection of what you do with it. So if MPC is 0.75, that means of your new income, you spend 75% on consumption and 25% your MPS on saving. To get the spending multiplier, you go one over MPS and you ask yourself, how many times does MPS go into one? So if we know MPS is 0.10, the spending multiplier will be 10, because 0 0.10 goes into 1 10 times. If it were 0 0.20, the spending multiplier would be 5. And the application of these multipliers goes like this. The government spends X amount of money, and they want to know that amount of money times the multiplier gives you the maximum multiplied effect to GDP. So the goal is to apply the multiplier. The other option is, they tell you, here's the maximum multiplied effect of GDP, Here's the multiplier, and we need to know how much money to spend. So in that scenario, you divide. So watch the wording of the question very carefully. The tax multiplier is less effective because taxation is not a direct part of GDP. It requires you deciding that you're actually going to spend the tax savings, but you'll save some, so it's less effective. The tax multiplier is the spending multiplier minus 1, so if the spending multiplier is 10, the tax multiplier will be 9. And then finally is something called the balanced budget multiplier, which relies on this assumption that the government actually cares about their budget, and they will tax the people as much as they spend. And if they were to do that, I know it seems like GDP would remain unchanged. If they were to do that because the spending multiplier has more power, then they would create the amount of money that they spent in the economy. 
meaning if they pulled 50 billion, they spent 50 billion, it wouldn't be zero change, it'd be an increase of 50 billion in the economy. That leads me to fiscal policy generally. The phrase fiscal policy refers to the Ways and Means Committee, Appropriations Committee. It refers to the legislature actually spending money. You only have two flavors here, taxation and spending. If the government seeks to contract the economy, slow it down from overheating, for example, because natural correction can be a bad thing, can lead to extremely inflated prices, we would raise taxes or decrease spending, and that would cause aggregate demand to shift left or return it back to full employment. To expand the economy, which is what we're doing right now, we would lower taxes and we would increase spending. Watch out for new transfer payments if the government decides to increase welfare. That technically is fiscal policy, and I would argue it's basically government spending, unless they do it in the form of a tax break. But either way, a transfer payment is effectively just welfare. New welfare programs are clearly fiscal policy. The second flavor would be automatic stabilizers, which are not new things. They're pre-existing. That's what you want to watch out for. If they're automatic stabilizers, they already existed. So an example would be our income tax system. The more wealth you have, the higher percentage of tax you pay. In theory, although you probably... Mm, never mind. Uh, and then the other option would be like welfare programs, transfer payments that are pre-existing, not currently in space or time. That was a weird exception. Uh, failures of fiscal policy. Number one, and I would say is the most common failure in the modern world, would be the time. You know, it takes a long time for the government to do anything, especially in a divided government, especially at the state government level where Texas only meets like 90 days every two years. So it takes a while for politicians to actually pass legislation to do this stuff. And the other thing is sometimes we over or undercorrect because of the multiplier effect. And the concern there is if we overcorrect or undercorrect, then we're off full plan and we have the same problem we had before. Cyclical issues, prices out of whack, Phillips curve drama. You get the gist. Unit three. In a nutshell.